Good morning, and welcome to today's webinar, Innovative Engineered Infrastructure Solutions for Challenging Drainage Projects. Our two presenters today are Doug Lowry, a licensed professional engineer from our Ontario team, and Drew Wilm, our sales engineer in British Columbia for Armtech Drainage Solutions Business Unit, whom I'll introduce more shortly. My name is Janine Yetke, Director of Marketing. My group runs Armtech Drainage Solutions webinar program, and I'll be your host for today's event. We also have James Carter on the line, who is our technical moderator, and who will be running questions and answers at the end of the session. First, I'll quickly go over some housekeeping items. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please enter them anytime into the question log. If you're sitting in a boardroom or with a group of people, please designate someone to collect and input the questions from the group into the question log. We, encour we encourage everyone to join in the discussion today. If we're not able to get to your question due to time constraints, rest assured we will respond directly through email after the webinar. Attending this session will qualify you for one hour technical and formal CPD credit. For those who have registered directly, we will send out the certificate to the email provided upon login. For those who are attending as a group, please compile your list of attendees and send, and send the attendance list with the required details to webinar at armtech.com. I'd like to start off with a brief introduction to Armtech, and then we'll go right into the webinar. We are one of Canada's oldest and largest infrastructure companies supplying solutions ranging from steel and HDPE-based bridge and culvert materials to precast building systems. With locations across the country, we are well positioned to serve your needs wherever you are, both nationally and internationally. As you can see, Armtech offers products in a wide range of categories, including precast products such as building systems, parking structures, and soundwall systems. On the drainage side of the business, we offer pipe and culvert, engineered steel bridge solutions, stormwater management systems, erosion control solutions, and much more. We serve numerous sectors from the municipal to forestry to mining and energy. More about how we service these sectors can be viewed on our newly revamped website or through discussion with one of our experienced sales representatives. With our centralized engineering department and regional engineers, ARMTECH has the exceptional capability to fully support design and challenging engineered project requirements. Our company also has expertise to take your project through all phases of the design and construction process with the design build delivery method. As you can see with this map, we have manufacturing and sales locations suited to meet your local needs across Canada. Presenting today are two ARMTECH employees, Doug Lowry and Drew Wilms. Both Doug and Drew have a wide range of experience with engineered solutions that meet myriads of challenges, some of which they will present today. Doug is a region engineer with ARMTECH's central market area with over 35 years in the industry. Doug is an active member in the Canadian Geotechnical Society and North American Geosynthetic Society. He has been actively involved in the specifying, design, and construction of numerous projects, solving an array of drainage and structural challenges for ARMTECH customers. Drew is a sales engineer with ARMTECH located in British Columbia, with past experience as a project manager in the construction and painting industry. He consults regularly with engineering consultants and municipalities to identify the best solutions for their needs based on the constraints they face. He supports ARMTEC's entire portfolio of drainage products, including bridge plate, multiplate, and MSE retaining walls. Both of them look forward to plenty of questions and answers after this presentation. And with that, I will now hand off this presentation to Drew Wilm. Welcome, Drew. Hello. Thanks, Janine. And thank you to everyone who's joining us today. So as Janine said, the topic for the webinar is uh, Engineered Infrastructure Solutions for challenging drainage projects. So just to give you a quick outline of where we're headed today, uh, Doug and I are going to be presenting on a number of case studies wherein ARMTECH was able to develop uh, somewhat unique and innovative solutions and engineered solutions to address whatever difficult challenges we are facing on these drainage projects. So we're going to break it down into four 
uh, case studies. First one will be the Panas culvert rehabilitation. Uh, so this is a case study that was presented on in one of the previous webinars, but I hope to go into uh, somewhat more technical uh, information and some uh, reasons as to why this solution was chosen over uh, some of the other alternatives that are out there. I'll then be touching on the YVR detention system, which is a project that we worked on here in BC in 2014. Uh, and then at that point, I'll pass it on to Doug to discuss the next two case studies. So the first case study, the Panas Culvert Rehabilitation. So this is a project that we worked on here uh, with the BC sales team uh, with the BC Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure. So they hired Associated Engineering uh, to come up with a solution for rehabilitating this culvert. Uh, so it's located at the Panas Tributary Creek, which is about 50 kilometers or half an hour outside of Kelowna. And it's along Highway 97C. So for those of you who are familiar with the area, it's a fairly high volume uh, artery throughout the interior of British Columbia, uh, not one that we're going to easily be able to shut down uh, in order to excavate this culvert or to do a standard replacement. Uh, so for that reason, or that was one of the main reasons that relining was selected uh, as a solution here. So you can see in this photo here on the right, uh, the existing culvert uh, is facing a, a significant, significant level of corrosion. It's a 2440 millimeter span. Uh, 1739 millimeter rise uh, multi-plate pipe arch and it's galvanized. Uh, so we'll talk about why that might not have been uh, the ideal uh, plate coating in this situation. Uh, but to give you a few, a little more insight into the project, a few of the main requirements that we were dealing with. Uh, of course, we wanted to restore the structural capacity of the culvert. Uh, as well, we needed to meet the ministry requirement of a 75 year service life for any new culverts or bridges that are installed along the highway. So you can see in this photo on the bottom left, again, you can see the corrosion uh, along the water line and along the haunches of the pipe arch. Uh, and then again, in the photo on the right, you can see another one of the challenges or constraints that we're dealing with as uh, a significant level of overburden over top of this pipe arch. So not ideal uh, for any sort of cut and fill uh, type application. So in addition to the 30 feet of surcharge that we we're facing, uh, another constraint was the difficult timeline that we were working within. Uh, so this is a fairly high mountainous path. So we were uh, faced with difficult winter conditions once we get into as early as early or late September, early October. Uh, and in addition to that, you saw fish baffles in one of the earlier photos that is a fish bearing stream and we were dealing with a, a somewhat narrow fish window as well. Uh, something else, a few con constraints to mention, uh, we were dealing with a maximum water velocity of up to three meters per second. Uh, we were also faced with the moderate sand and gravel bed loads, so that'll tie into a discussion on structural plate durability in the next few slides. Uh, again, also tying into that, we were uh, dealing with acidic drain rock. So originally when this culvert was backfilled, uh, they sourced the backfill from a nearby mine, and it was actually acidic uh, rock that they installed it with. Uh, so we were faced with water inside the conduit with a pH between 4 and 9 and uh, leach it from the acidic surcharge between th with a pH of uh, ranging from 3 to 9. So that was around the conduit. So somewhat of a unique situation here where we were faced with corrosion on both sides of the culvert. And you can see the ultimate result of that uh, was that we have the steel completely corroded through. So you're looking at the soil uh, backfill around the structure there uh, and the, the steel liner is completely gone. And it was uh, the case uh, in numerous locations along the 97 meter long culvert. Uh, so it kind of highlights a few things. Uh, first and foremost, uh, it does highlight the robust nature of soil steel structures uh, and that we didn't experience a catastrophic failure uh, despite part of the line uh, being gone. Uh, but in addition, it also really shows the importance of uh, noting the durability of the structural plate products and uh, determining what the appropriate coating is depending on your site conditions and also making sure you don't have acidic drain rock. Um, but in general, just I thought this would be a good segue to discuss structural plate durability in itself. Um, so the technology has certainly improved. Uh, galvanized steel used to be the only option as far as coatings for structural plate, uh, but we've now developed aluminum structural plate, and we also have polymer coated structural plate. So Armtech's trade name for this product is Stratacat coating. And essentially what this is, we start with our corrugated steel structural plate, uh, and it's just black steel. We send it to be sandblasted so that's nice and clean. Uh, we then apply a zinc rich layer or primer, uh, which prepares the surface for application of a baked on powder coat or polymer finish layer. So essentially this layer, it's an ethylene acrylic acid base. Uh, polymer provides uh, much superior resistance to corrosion, to abrasion, 
uh, inorganic acids, salts, all those types of harsh conditions uh, in which galvanized or aluminum uh, wouldn't be uh, suitable. So you can see on this uh, the chart on the bottom, uh, most of our structural plate products are available uh, with the Stratocat coating. So as far as determining uh, which coating is appropriate for whatever site conditions you're dealing with, uh, the CSDI or the Corrugated Steel Pipe Institute uh, has come up with a number of coating selection criteria uh, which help determine which coating is appropriate based on uh, the soil and water chemistry. Uh, so I mentioned previously, uh, just in regards to the first section criteria, abrasion, uh, we had a, a water velocity up to three meters per second, and I said we were dealing with moderate uh, bed loads of sand and gravel. So that put us at an abrasion level of three, and so you can see in the chart just below that, uh, that a polymer coating is appropriate uh, for that abrasion level. Next, the pH that we were dealing with was between three and nine. Uh, so again, you can see the polymer coating is appropriate in this situation, uh, whereas aluminized steel or aluminum uh, and galvanized steel are not appropriate uh, for that pH range. Resistivity, I believe, was assumed to be 1,500 uh, ohm centimeters for the project, so not an issue either. Uh, and again, hardness and chlorides were not so much a factor for this project. So just as far as determining uh, what the estimated material service life would be, uh, I'll start out with a, a galvanized plate. Uh, so this isn't really specified in the CHBDC or the Canadian Highway Bridge and Design Code. So instead we revert to this estimated material service life approach or EMFL approach. And what this is, we assume uh, for galvanized steel that there's a uniform rate of corrosion along the surface of the plate. And so through that, we gain our corrosion allowance uh, across the lifespan of the structure. So we assume a level of consumed steel, uh, certain thickness of residual steel, and then outside of that range, we design for our nominal structural steel. So this approach deal, uh, varies slightly for the polymer coated structural plate. Uh, so instead of assuming a uniform rate of corrosion initially, uh, we actually put an add-on service life uh, for the Stratocat polymer coating. And this is, again, going to be determined based on, you know, the pH, uh, the same selection criteria that we were dealing with before, uh, the level of organics as well in the system. So once we have that add-on service life, whether it's 50 years, 75 years, uh, we then, again, use the same model as we do for the galvanized steel. So we assume a uniform rate of corrosion across the surface of the steel, assuming all the polymer coating has, is gone at this point. Uh, so that gives us our corrosion allowance. And then once again, we design for our nominal structural steel. So with all those factors taken into consideration, uh, really promoted the use of a, a reline based on the overburden, and then we applied a polymer coated uh, multi-plate pipe bar. So it was a 2046 by 1538 millimeter uh, structure. And a few other unique things that we did with the project, we supplied polymer coated hardware, so nuts and bolts, uh, which was the first time we'd done that in Canada. And that was to ensure that we didn't have any uh, durability issues or corrosion issues at the joints, at the bolted connections. We also supplied aluminum fish baffles to replace the concrete ones. And then we supplied uh, the structure itself with four millimeter thick crown plates and six millimeter thick invert plates as that was the location of the majority of the corrosion issues. So you can see, you can tell a few things from this section here. Uh, we also supplied it with 200 millimeter half couplings, so those are important for the contractor to be able to perform grouting between the two structures. And I'll run through the installation procedure in the next few slides. Uh, but you can tell that we specify uh, doing the installation in a number of lifts or grout pours. And so that's fairly important uh, with a structure of this size. Typically, two pours are fine, uh, but once we get into larger structures, three or four uh, grout lifts are typical. So this photo here just shows a similar section of the actually installed structure. So we have the four millimeter crown plate, six millimeter invert plates. You can see the black uh, polymer coated steel and then the aluminum fish baffles. So I'll just run uh, a little bit through the installation procedure. So PW Trenches was the contractor uh, on the project. So they did a very good job. Uh, the first step was dewatering and cleaning. Uh, you can imagine that's a bit of a backbreaking task uh, for this culvert. We have a lot of sediment and debris in there. And we also have the concrete fish baffles that needed to be jacked out. Uh, so they did a great job with that, a very clean looking culvert, which is important for the performance of the grout. Uh, the next step is to install the rails or bracing. So the rails on the bottom are typically greased uh, to allow the multiplate to be uh, slid into their slip line easily. And then we install um, rails on, on the top and the sides of the culvert as well, just to prevent flotation 
during the routing process. So the next step is to prepare a staging area. So just somewhere that you're able to assemble the multi-plate uh, and then, of course, assembly and flip lining are the next steps. So this is essentially an iterative process. So they assemble the couple of rings, uh, they flip line it, and then they assemble the next rings. Uh, yeah, so iterative process, as I said. So the, here's a photo of the flip lining happening from inside the culvert. So they simply used an excavator uh, with a chain. They put some lugs in some of the voltage connections to pull this culvert through. Uh, fairly impressive that they were able to do so uh, with just an excavator for a 97 meter long installation, but it worked. Uh, the next step was grouting. So I mentioned we installed it with grout ports. So they hooked up to that uh, and filled the voids between the two structures. So this is a very important step uh, to make sure that we're filling the annulus between the two structures so that we uh, ensure that all the loads are transferred to this new liner so that it can act in ring compression. So it's important to remember that these are designed as flexible structures. And so we do need uh, that uniform transfer of loads uh, to make sure it's performing structurally. So for that reason, we do uh, typically specify grout inspection ports. So in this case, uh, the contractor just drilled small holes in the plate to ensure that the grout is fully encapsulated, uh, made its way up and around the crown. So the final step uh, or point to note were end treatments. So uh, in this case, they just did grouted end treatments and beveled ends, uh, at least on the downstream ends. So of course, as we're installing a new liner inside of an existing culvert, we're losing uh, some level of hydraulic capacity in a reduced end area. So oftentimes there are certain measures that we take to help minimize uh, those losses, in this case, just the beveled ends. And I believe they're also installing a head wall this summer uh, to help reduce or minimize the impact uh, on the upstream end. So there's a photo of the installation team. Overall, it was a, quite a successful project. We did get it installed before inclement weather hit. We beat the fish window. Uh, and overall, the ministry was very happy and uh, pleased with the overall result. So I'll just run quickly through the next case study, uh, the YVR detention system. Uh, so this was the project we worked on with the Vancouver Airport Authority in conjunction with Urban Systems, who they hired to design their uh, northern service employee parking lot. So this was located at the Vancouver International Airport, of course. And so a few of the project requirements, uh, we were designing for 200 cubic meters of storage volume. So of course they're paving an area, increasing the imperv impervious surface. Uh, so we need to somehow minimize the impact on the storm sewer system. Uh, so for that reason, we're detaining the, uh, the runoff. Uh, an additional requirement was that we needed to meet a minimum 75 year service life. So uh, in that way, we run through the same selection criteria as I went through with the math culvert. And ultimately, a polymer coating was selected as well. Uh, and then another requirement was to minimize uh, the infiltration and exfiltration uh, in the system. So a few challenges or constraints that we were dealing with. Uh, primary uh, issue was the geometric constraint. So we had to fit the system in a trench width of 4.5 meters. Uh, we had a maximum excavation depth of 1.9 meters. So we were dealing with a fairly high water table. And so overall, the available footprint was 60 meters by 4.8 meters. So not a, lo not a lot of room within which to fit those 200 cubic meters of storage. Uh, in addition to that, we were dealing with time-dependent constraints. So they needed the system on site within four weeks of an order placement. So that's including uh, doing up the approval drawings, the drafting, engineering, uh, and then the fabrication. So fairly tall order there, uh, but we were able to meet the deadline. So ultimately, the solution uh, is dual runs, 55 meters long of the 1,400 diameter health core CSP. That's just our helically wound uh, corrugated steel pipe. As I said, we supplied it with a polymer laminate, uh, and trench coat is the name of our uh, coating. And so it's a slightly different coating than our Stratacat. This is for just our corrugated steel pipe and not our structural plate. Uh, but they do, uh, they do have a lot of similarities as far as performance goes. It's a laminate, though, on the steel coil instead of a baked on powder coat. Uh, we also supply the system with H500 hugger band couplers, and those are designed so as to minimize uh, the amount of infiltration or exfiltration through the system, as well as to maximize the pull part resistance. So there's a photo of the uh, installed culvert, or at least assembled. And so you can see we have the dual runs. We have uh, some fabricated elbows, manhole risers as well with a ladder. And we can see the uh, hugger band couplers here and then the flow restricting outlet stub as well. So 
So I just thought I'd speak a little bit more generally about CSP de detention systems. Uh, so what they are, we can fabricate them out of our Hellcore uh, or Ultraflow CSP, which is our spiral rip corrugated steel pipes. So essentially what that is, for those of you who might not be familiar, uh, we have an exterior corrugation on the pipe and then we have a smooth inner wall. So it's a very hydraulically efficient storm pipe. Uh, it's very effective in competing against concrete pipe as well, hydraulically. Uh, so essentially what we do with these pipes, we simply prefabricate bulkheads and fittings to meet whatever your storage requirements are and to meet the footprint requirements that you have as well. So you can see on the bottom left uh, an incomplete system. So we would put a manifold on the end of those uh, CSP runs. And then on the bottom right, you can see a polymer coated system with some reinforced bulkheads and then access risers. So as I've mentioned, we can supply these with a number of different coatings. So we have aluminized CSP, the polymer laminated option as well, uh, in the cases where, you, where we have fairly aggressive sites. Uh, and as well, the smooth interior of the UltraFlow definitely simplifies the maintenance process. Uh, just makes it easier on the guys, uh, the maintenance crews coming around with the back truck. Uh, they don't have debris or silt getting caught up in those corrugations. So I'll just uh, talk briefly about some design considerations for CSP detention. Uh, first and foremost, we need to know what the required storage volume is. So whether you determine this with the rational method or SDS method uh, to get your pre and post development uh, hydrographs. Uh, so we need that to help with the design. Uh, next, we need to know the geometry and the footprint. So essentially, if you can give us these two uh, pieces of the puzzle, we can really help uh, design what the most economical uh, system is going to be to meet those requirements. So thirdly, we need to know what the required lifespan is as well. Uh, so that's going through the same uh, selection coding or coding selection criteria uh, as far as what the pH is, abrasion, and all those things. Uh, next, pretreatment is also a very important consideration. Uh, so oftentimes what we'd like to see is uh, an oil interceptor or uh, preferably an, a hydrodynamic separator to remove any solid uh, silts or floatables that might be in the system, just to prevent any clogging uh, that might happen at the, at the outfall, as well as to uh, you know, increase the maintenance cycle. So it's a lot easier just to go in and, uh, and uh, treat or clean out one uh, manhole cell unit instead of this detention system. So fifthly, uh, infiltration and exfiltration is also a factor. Um, so CSP detention systems are by no means watertight, although we can minimize the infiltration and exfiltration with our Huggerman couplers. Um, but if you do need a watertight system, uh, an HDPE uh, system would probably be the better option. Uh, the outflow and release structure is again, one of the other considerations. So most often we simply see a flow restricting outlet sub. Um, but we also see a lot of or orifice plates, uh, weirs. I've seen sluice gates installed as well. Uh, so there are a number of different options for controlling your outflow. And then lastly, of course, maintenance, which ties into the pretreatment. Um, but we do install these with the access risers and ladders and all those sort of things uh, that would be required to maintain the system. So just overall, to recap a few advantages of the CSP detention, uh, it's definitely customizable shapes. It's not an off-the-shelf type system. Every single one is designed fully custom for to meet your project requirements. Uh, they are very cost effective relative to the other solutions, perhaps concrete detention or PVC that are out there. Um, so for the most part, these are going to be far more economical. And that is another reason that this was chosen for the YBR detention system. Uh, again, we also have very familiar installation methods. So contractors know how to install corrugated steel pipe. And there's nothing different between installing these uh, detention systems versus your standard runs of CSP. Uh, lastly, we can also perforate these systems to create a retention or infiltration system. So I did mention briefly uh, that HDPE systems would be uh, the way to go if you need a watertight system. So we can supply these as well. It's really the same idea uh, as with the CSP. We're just installing uh, HDPE runs with prefabricated bulkheads or fittings uh, to meet your project requirements. Uh, but you do get a watertight system and also a very durable system uh, with that HDPE coating. And with that, I will pass it on to Doug Lowry to talk about the next few case studies. Thanks, Drew. The uh, first of two case studies involves the Noisy River Bridge. And uh, that particular project is located about an hour northwest of Toronto in the county of Dufferin. And the project generally involved the replacing of cast in place box collar, which uh, doesn't sound uh, too, too onerous, but in fact, uh, there were some site constraints that really uh, complicated the uh, process. Uh, here's a picture of the existing structure, 
and you can see it's in a little bit of distress. So you can see a pretty major crack uh, just uh, above and to the left of my associate. And also you can see that that left-hand uh, vertical wall isn't vertical anymore. So uh, that was uh, what we were dealing with. That structure actually at the time that we looked at it, uh, which was a few months in advance of the tender process, uh, was strutted or braced uh, because they were concerned about uh, catastrophic failure on that particular structure. So the, basically there were two major uh, constraints. One was that we could not close the road. Uh, that would, closing the road, uh, it's a major north-south uh, road up towards uh, Georgian Bay, and it would have meant something like about a 35-kilometer detour uh, over a period of a few months, which was just not tenable uh, to uh, basically the motoring motoring public. Uh, so that was the one constraint. And the second one was an environmental one where uh, there was no contamination or entering of the stream, no diversion uh, was going to be allowed in order to make that structure, uh, uh, make the construction happen. So we were called in or asked to come in, step in with the consultant uh, quite early on in, in the process. And uh, they did indicate to us that they wanted to use one of our, our corrugated steel structures uh, to replace this structure. Uh, however, they were at a bit of a loss, or they were certainly looking for ideas on how to uh, build this, working around those uh, two constraints. We couldn't help them too, too much with the, the environmental side, but we certainly could help them with uh, not having to close the road. And, of course, the other limitation was that we had to stick within the uh, right-of-way, as we do on most projects. So uh, in order to keep the road open, uh, there had to be stage construction. And in order to have stage construction, we had to have a detour because there was just not enough room at the top of the embankment in order to create a detour uh, that would allow uh, the actual stage construction. So the proposal was to put a temporary geotextile wall at the uh, west end of the existing structure. And what does that temporary geotextile wall do? And in this case, the wall in this photograph, the wall has been built, and you can see the detour uh, between the uh, two rows of Jersey barriers there. So uh, the geotextile uh, temporary wall is pretty much just geotextile and backfill. So the geotextile, and this is a high performance or a high tenacity geotextile, much higher than uh, run-of-the-mill slit tape woven geotextiles. That's uh, what's indicated by the red line. So we placed the geotextile on the ground, uh, put a little bit of tension on it, and then basically uh, flip it up and over the temporary wood form that's at the front face of the wall. And then we backfill or partially backfill in behind uh, the fabric and the wall. And then ultimately we flip that uh, flap of geotextile on the left side of the screen and tuck it back into the uh, into the backfill. So stage one or level one rack is, is constructed. Now, level two is constructed in a similar fashion using additional temporary forms. And then once you construct the second level, you actually pull the form out from level one, which you can see in the slide, and move it up to level three. And we just basically leapfrog our way vertically uh, as we construct the wall. So the forms go from one, three, five, seven, et cetera, and two, four, six, eight. And we just repeat that process until we have the finished wall. So here you can see the uh, protruding uh, end of the existing structure. You can see the uh, wrap face of the high straight woven geotextile and some of the forms are still left in place. So that provided enough room to create the detour and it was a one lane detour. They used uh, control, uh, traffic lights to control the traffic uh, over the life of the construction period. So now we have uh, enough room to go in and demolish the uh, east end of the structure and, uh, and create the new and, and build a new structure. So the product that was chosen in order to as a replacement structure is bridge plate, and this was actually the first bridge plate structure constructed in Ontario, and I believe it was the second or third constructed in Canada. Uh, 
And so bridge plate is a 400 by 150 millimeter uh, corrugated steel plate. You can see it's significantly uh, stronger and and stiffer than our six inch by two inch multi-plate. Multi-plate being around about 70 years now, uh, bridge plate about uh, one fifth of that. So predominantly bridge plate is used for arches and boxes with spans from about five to 20 meters, uh, depending on whether it's a span or an arch. And we have done other shapes, but those are the two dominant ones, at least with regards to infrastructure. So the, the structure itself was 36 meters long, which means it was comprised of 30 rings at 1.2 meters each. Uh, it was a nine meter span, a four and a half meter rise. So it was a half round structure founded on concrete footings. And it was kind of a neat little job because uh, you can actually see the old structure in, tucked inside the, a little bit inside the, um, uh, the, the, the new structure. And when they went in and demolished that, they were actually able to use the uh, footings from the from the existing structure, or the uh, precast a place structure, and use that as a working platform. So they were uh, used that not only to help uh, prevent contamination during the demolition of the existing structure and the dropping of bolts, etc., uh, but it also was an aid to uh, installation of the plates. And the consultant determined that the footing or the failure of the footing was really what was behind the failure of that cast and place structure. Uh, it wasn't the structure itself, but the footing gave way. And that was the first structure that we basically, we knew it was there. We actually uncovered the remains of two other structures as we were doing the excavation on this particular project. So uh, the bridge plate structure is five millimeter thick plates. There are five plates per ring. You can see at this end of the structure, the uh, there's a, a stagger on the foot, what we call the footing plates or the plates that attach to the unbalanced channel. Uh, and that way we're able to stagger the joints as we go down the length of the structure. So we have a long footing plate, a short footing plate. We switch those back and forth, uh, alternating um, at each ring. And then we have the uh, three top plates, top arc plates that make up the rest of the arch. And as we said, this is stage construction. So it was uh, basically constructed in halves, uh, 18 meters long, eight, roughly 18 meters long at a time. So here again, uh, you just see some steel construction uh, uh, erection on the left. And on the right hand side, the first half of the structure has been uh, assembled and torqued. And although, and as you can see my mouse, right there is the second temporary wall, very similar to the first one, uh, which is retaining the backfill at the midpoint of the structure. At the far end of the structure on the right hand side, it was just a, a two to one slope. The reason for that wall is that if we went to a two to one slope with the backfill, uh, there would, again would not have been enough room to create the detour, uh, the stage two detour for uh, for the balance of the construction. So here is a better shot. You can see all the forms in place at the midpoint of the structure. Backfill is still progressing and ultimately is backfilled over the top and paved. At that point, we're able to go in, demolish the west half of the structure and uh, drive the uh, sheet piling, construct the footing and assemble the uh, balance of the structure in the same way that we did on the first half. Uh, backfilling operation, we uh, strongly recommend keeping fairly light equipment in close to the structure, about a meter away. Uh, after that, you can use riding equipment, and then also uh, when there's sufficient cover, you can also ride over top of the structure. So this is the uh, finished structure uh, the following spring, and we actually finished the job in late November, and the vegetation hasn't quite taken yet, but uh, you can see that... Uh, Basically, the structure is uh, is 100 almost 100 percent complete at that point. Uh, we just need some vegetation to catch in, which it has very nicely. And the site's very cool up there today. It looks very similar to that right now. So that completes uh, the Noisy River Bridge case study. The second one involved replacement of a rail trestle near London, Ontario, and this rail trestle 
was constructed originally about 1900. So it's getting, you know, it was over 100 years old. Uh, it was becoming a significant maintenance issue for CP Rail, even though this is only a spur line uh, for CP. And they really were looking for a no maintenance, low maintenance solution to what you see on the screen. Uh, and, but they wanted it also constructed with a minimum uh, track shutdown, which is the norm working with the railroads. So again, working early on and closely with the consulting engineer in this particular case, which was Hatchmont McDonald, uh, we proposed uh, a double barrel uh, multi-plate structure with a sheeting cutoff wall. And uh, here you can see that uh, under construction, you can see uh, one barrel going in and it's being installed uh, on top of the uh, sheeting cutoff wall. So this is the upstream end of the structure. So that kind of handled the drainage portion, but you still had to uh, somehow deal with the trestle. So the plan was to take the trestle out, uh, take it out of service, not so much take it out, take it out of service, and uh, replace the trestle with back-to-back one-to-one -back, uh, -one engineered reinforced slopes. So those are uniaxial geogrids being installed there. Uh, that's an eight-meter high embankment, which means the grid is about eight meters long. Uh, in that particular case. So we didn't worry too much about the bents, the vertical bents there. We worked around those and uh, were able to construct this uh, replacement structure. So here, this is the downstream end, and you can see we're partially constructed now. We've got the multi-plates in. Uh, they actually had uh, river rock uh, installed inside those structures as well. Uh, they're buried slightly relative to the stream bed. Non-woven geotextile underneath the riprap. And on top of that, you still see that they're trying to uh, working on completing the slope. Now, the again, if you can see my cursor, that is the front face of the geotextile. So it's somewhat similar to what we did on the Noisy River Bridge, where we wrapped the geotextile around the front face and tucked it back into the embankment. That was not a requirement of ArmTech. Uh, the client asked that that be done. And we obliged. It just meant the supply. It didn't impact anything. It just meant it had to supply a little bit more geogrid, which is not a big deal. So we're happy to do that. And here you can see the buried bents slowly disappearing. And we're getting close to the point uh, uh, during the construction where they're going to have to uh, have an outage on the track, take the, the top of the trestle, cut it right off, and uh, salvage the track and then complete the embankment. And the next slide shows just that. You can see the track in the top left corner of the uh, screen has been reestablished. And now they're just kind of tidying up. They're putting a uh, geocell honeycomb product on the slope over top of the grid. So this is the wrap, the exposed face of the geogrid here where my pointer is. This is the honeycomb. And that is uh, anchored to the face of the slope, infill with topsoil, and then uh, seeded sought it, whatever the choice of the uh, of the client is. In this case, it was hydro seeded and to establish the stand of vegetation. So originally, the erosion control blankets that you see in the screen were not part of the contract. They were added later. This job also was completed heading into the fall, and we and the access to the job site was via private property through a farm. And trying to minimize the uh, potential for having to come back and do um, additional work in the spring, we made the recommendation that they, after they've done the soil amendments, that they uh, install a relatively light uh, erosion control blanket over top of the uh, nitro-seeded slope and just to help protect it over the course of the winter and also help establish uh, a vegetation in the spring. And it seemed to work uh, fairly well. This is the completed structure later on, uh, the year after construction. And you can see, yes, there are some bare spots there, uh, but if you went back there today, that's all been filled in. And the structure, uh, engineered slope, and multi-plates are performing extremely well. So that concludes my presentation. I'll turn it back over to Janine. Doug and Drew, thank you very much for your presentation today. And thank you, everyone, for joining today's webinar. 
We hope you enjoyed the presentation uh, and, hope, and hope that you also found the information very valuable. Our question and answer period is coming up. Um, please submit your questions. And if we can't get to all the questions, uh, we will definitely follow up with you uh, directly after the webinar. First, I'd like to review a couple of housekeeping items. And uh, please stay tuned in for our Q&A session in just one minute. For more information on what you've heard today, please contact a local sales representative by locating them on our website. Or feel free to contact one of today's speakers at the following email addresses. We have a full webinar lineup for 2015, but we'll be taking a summer hi hiatus from our webinar series, and we'll be resuming in October on the topic, Stormwater Detention and Retention Systems and Accessories. Also, I want to remind you that CPD certificates will be issued for this session. Please send names, titles, and emails to webinars at armtech.com if you're participating in a group format. Otherwise, if you've log logged in directly, we will send the certificates within a short time. Registration links for webinars can always be found on our website, so keep checking our news and webinars section for postings of upcoming events. Please stay connected with us. You can follow us on social media on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter, and you can view past webinars on YouTube and SlideShare. This webinar will also be posted there in a short time. Have you seen our website recently? You can also Find out all the latest on ArmTech on our newly revamped website, armtech.com. We really do value your feedback, and at the end of this webinar, there will be a quick exit survey. We would like to know what you think of this event. Question six will ask if you're interested in re receiving more invita invitations for ArmTech webinar events. Due to strict Canadian anti-spam legislation, we are required to have your consent to receive future invitations. So if you want to ensure that you're on our invitation mailing list, please, please choose yes to consent on our exit survey. Again, if you choose no, you will be permanently removed from all emails. So please, we really, really hope that you choose yes. Thanks again for joining today. Now we're going to go into questions and answers, which will be moderated by Jane. Over to you, Jane. Thanks very much, Denise. What is the minimum space required, so this is for you, Drew, between the multi-plate and the old one when relining our culvert? Uh, all right, yeah, that's a good question, one that comes up pretty frequently. Uh, typically, we would specify about 50 to 100 millimeters uh, between the two structures, um, but again, it does depend on a number of different factors. So uh, depending on what the existing condition is of the structure, whether a lot of deflections or whatnot, you may not be able to, uh, you know, get that close to the existing structure. So in that case, you may need to do more. Um, but of course, we want to minimize uh, the amount of losses for the hydraulic capacity. And also, it's a factor as far as uh, if we're able to get the grout pumped in there. Uh, so actually, for the, the Panaskri line, we did something interesting. We supplied actually two sample rings. So one, uh, one ring mimicking the new structure and then one mimicking the old one so that they could actually test their grout mix. Um, because they were worried about a few things. They needed to design the mix as well um, to help combat the corrosion issues and the acidic drain rock. Uh, so in that case, yeah, we are, I mean, we're able to help with the guidelines as well. But yeah, typically, just uh, generally speaking, 50 to 100 millimeters is what we would recommend. How do you account for bends or deflections when in the existing culvert? Um, yeah, same thing. I mean, that's always going to be an issue. So we need to make sure that the existing culvert is properly surveyed so that we know uh, if there are any deflections uh, or, you know, anything like that. Uh, if there are actually like an elbow in the existing structure, we, we have accommodated things like that in the past. It's kind of a, a case by case issue. Um, but yeah, particularly we do have another product, our, our tunnel liner plate, which is actually assembled inside of an existing structure and the same reline type applications, but it's a, it's a two flange liner that can be bolted together and has a consistent outer diameter so that it can be bolted together inside of the structure. And so with that product, we do have a little more flexibility uh, in meeting any elbows uh, that might be in the structure, but yeah, deflections, kind of a case by case basis. Regarding projects similar to the first project discussed, does ArmTech offer solutions that involve compensating for corroded haunches or floors by installing plates over top of them uh, and bolting to either side. 
Um, so I'm assuming they're just talking about simply replacing the invert plates. Uh, to my knowledge, that's not something that's been done. And it would probably be difficult uh, because you need access to both sides of the structure um, for the multi-plate voltage connection. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure if that would be possible. Typically, uh, just a full reline would be required in that case. I'm not sure if Doug has anything to add to that. Uh, not really, Drew. Thank you. Um, I, I know that question actually comes up quite frequently, and I have in my years here, I've yet to see that very difficult okay. to to uh, put a plate over a plate. And then uh, this one's for you, Doug. On, on the first uh, case you showed, why did they choose a multi-plate arch uh, versus a precast box culvert? Uh, it was economy. Uh, and typically. Well, there's a couple of things, actually. One is that consulting engineering firm kind of likes to uh, lead the charge when it comes to our relatively new products, and that product was uh, fairly new. Uh, but uh, I think ultimately the driving force was uh, was one of economy, and typically we can put two of those structures in for the cost of a concrete structure. For the Putnam Rail trestle project, what was the filler for geocells? Was Top soil or dirt placed in the geo cells or just over top, or, or sorry, are filled uh, over top of uh, filled gravel or granular. Well, the the embankment itself was uh, ba basically uh, uh, predominantly native fill, uh, and then the honeycomb or the geo cell over top uh, was in fact uh, four inches deep, so it's 100 millimeter deep material, and it was top soil. And then seated on the hydro seated afterwards. And then there was a there is a question here with respect to cost the cast in place. What is the cost differential typically? Uh, the big advantage with with steel or, or besides that is one of construction time. If if you were to do let's say you went in to do either one of those two structures in cast in place concrete, you'd be there for a significantly longer time period. Uh, than you would be with um, uh, with corrugated steel, and I'm not sure how you would do that second structure, the Putnam uh, trussel job. Uh, I don't think that it'd be very difficult to do. Well, I guess it could be done in in cast in place, yeah, but it'd be challenging. Uh, good question here about the fabric wall. Um, what's the temporary? What's the life expectancy of the temporary wall? Well, it, it has a little bit to do with uh, the operating conditions of the wall. Uh, typically, those walls that we do here in Ontario are generally only exposed for, I'm going to say, somewhere around 12 months or so. Uh, but uh, they could last three years or more, depending on how much UV exposure. So the, And the only thing that's going to potentially break down is the front face. The reinforcement is there forever. The second wall, the wall that was built at the midpoint, and I forgot to mention this, uh, of that structure uh, with the stage construction, that wall is still there today. It just happens to be buried at the midpoint of the structure and the midpoint of the road. And it will be there forever. So, so I basically, as the fabric wall, uh, even if it were to, uh, to disintegrate a bit, you wouldn't have any major fail, slope failure or anything like that? Well, uh, again, um, and I, I can't cite a, a wall specifically, but I can cite um, sort of, I'll say, overexposed uh, to UV, like geotextiles overexposed to, to ultraviolet rays. And it, as long as you kind of just leave them alone, uh, they'll stay there. And uh, so even if it does break down, uh, I don't see it. You would never use that as a permanent wall, but on a temporary wall, uh, I don't see any issues with that lasting throughout the life of the structure. Worst case, I mean, let's say the job suddenly goes to five years or if somebody walks away or whatever the case happens to be, it gets left exposed for an extended period of time still has to function. You can always come in and... Uh, you know, put uh, shotcrete or something on that as well, just to protect it. But that's never been done that I know of, because it didn't have to be done. So, a good question here about the geotextile. 
Um, does it require any maintenance or replacement during lifetime? Not at all. And maybe if I could just add a little um, uh, anecdote here to, uh, to, the, to the previous question is that we actually uh, took a number of uh, road superintendents and those kinds of folks up to that project while it was under construction. And I was standing in front of the wall trying to explain the wall without the nice PowerPoint slides. And the one guy said, so what's in behind that, uh, behind the geotextile? What's making that stand up so straight? And I said, nothing. I said, that is just geotextile and granular fill in behind. And he said, Doug, I don't believe you. And so I took a knife and I slit the front face of one of those uh, lifts uh, of the wall. And he became a believer. So, but the granular was actually standing basically on its own in behind the fascia. It's a very cost-effective wall system versus other things like sheeting, soldier piles and lagging, what have you. Uh, thanks, thanks everyone for questions today. Um, we have uh, come to the end. Um, if a few kind of trickle in here, we may answer them, but uh, otherwise we're, we're getting close. So if there's anyone in a boardroom today and there are kind of questions being uh, shared amongst your group, please get them in here and we'll um, uh, we'll get them to, uh, to to Doug. Okay, thank you everybody for joining today. Thanks very much. Have a wonderful day. Thanks to Doug and Drew. And again, uh, please vi visit us, uh, armtech.com forward slash events for upcoming events. Uh, you'll get your CPD credits in the next week. Uh, as well, um, feel free to share the uh, webinar. It'll be up on YouTube towards the end of next week as well, um, along with the slides which will be shared on SlideShare. Um, and your CPD credit email, you'll have a link there as well for that.